So thanks everyone for uh, for joining today. Uh, my name is Jeff Dion. Um, I'm one of the uh, co-creators of uh, the JCore open source project. Uh, we have Rob Landley here also. Hello. And uh, hopefully today we can tell you a little bit about uh, uh, what it is we we've done here and uh, why that's cool. Um, so I think the first thing uh, is what is this? Uh, uh, maybe many people don't know exactly what um, JCore is. Uh, uh, as uh, Seven had mentioned, it's an open implementation of specifically the Super H Compact instruction set architecture. That's a, a CPU uh, core architecture from the late 90s. Um, it was the best-selling hardware. It was the best-selling CPU in the world for three years. It was yeah. a very big deal that was sidelined for reasons that had nothing to do with the technology. It was global financial things, IP and hand the, passing from company to company. And the good thing about it is it's patent clean. So uh, instead of making something brand new and hoping that there are no submarine patents, we know for a fact, because it's been in the marketplace for uh, now over 20 years, that uh, this is uh, an intellectual property clean uh, implementation. The instruction set architecture has no problems and it can be used. The fundamental patents on the way the instruction set architecture uh, is encoded eventually led to uh, something called ARM Thumb, which everybody is probably familiar with. Um, uh, obviously, those patents were not expired when ARM was using them, so uh, there's some. Uh, uh, financial uh, implications for ARM from that that uh, that they ended up having to deal with. Um, the uh, JCore family uh, implements SH Compact Plus. There are extensions for symmetric multiprocessing and to make efficient use in FPGAs and ASICs. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, it's a contemporary uh, contemporary uh, uh, CPU core to Motorola 68000 but uh, a real step up from something like that. So Not exactly contemporary, slight successor, but we'll get into timelines later. Yeah, so why did we build something like this? Uh, why did we spend the time to make a, a CPU core architecture? Well, it was purpose-built for uh, connected embedded systems. Uh, we build uh, energy monitors, devices that uh, work in critical infrastructure on the electricity grids. And the JCore architecture uh, is deployed in uh, such critical infrastructure applications and has been now for five or seven years. It's a well-tested uh, um, uh, set of intellectual property. Uh, we surveyed the choices that were available at the time, Spark and MIPS, uh, of course, ARM, uh, which was patented still, uh, even, the, even the, the, the older ARM7 devices, and OpenRISC. Uh, we found that uh, Super H had done a lot of work on the design of the instruction set architecture, not just thinking through what the instructions should do, but studying things like the output from the compiler statistics to make sure that the design was going to achieve the kinds of performance uh, metrics that uh, one needs for embedded systems specifically. Uh, that was before things were called Internet of Things. And for us, the main issue was memory bandwidth. Uh, we have uh, a lot of DMA going on in our in our commercial designs. Um, uh, multiple streams of DMA happening simultaneously, sample sample streams, and uh, we needed to leave as much memory bandwidth available as possible for th that kind of thing to happen. The cleanness of the SH architecture, the way that it's designed to work with uh, higher level languages is really important to us. Um, if I could uh, point out something, instruction set density is an extremely important metric. You can express more code in fewer bytes using the Super H architecture than you could anything else at the time. And since then, it's gotten more complicated because there's more architectures. There's a lot of knock-on, positive knock-on effects of that, um, such as more code stays in cache, you flush the cache less often, that newer architectures have had more resources to play with. 
so they've gotten less lean. You know, there there were entire cul-de-sacs of, you know, Pentium 4 and stuff with, with long pipelining that when we say it was a local peak in language design space, what is available in FPGA now is analogous to what was available in ASIC some number of years ago. And that local peak has kind of swung around and lined up. So there's... There's a longer conversation to have here, but we we did a lot of research on what we should implement. And in fact, Super H was not the first one that we we tried for the uh, the Synchrophaser project. Jeff mentioned um, we tried Leon Spark first, and we went, okay, this is there, this is complete, this has the whole the might of the European Space Agency behind it, and it doesn't meet our needs. Super H of all the architectures we could have cloned was the best fit for our needs. And it's really not a surprise that that kind of thing uh, happened uh, with Hitachi doing a uh, massive investment program in uh, Super H in the early 90s. Uh, at the time they were licensing 68K, it was clearly not a long-term solution. Uh, 68K had other uh, ideas, this is before Cold Fire. But uh, as Rob mentions, uh, you can now do interesting things like uh, emulating Sega games or uh, even an entire engine controller if you're still interested in internal combustion engines, yet another topic, um, uh, and replicate the kinds of things that were early design wins for Super H that made it the, uh, the market leader uh, for a few years in the 90s. And, of course, this is just good technology as a result. It's an excellent solid foundation uh, that you can use to build any kind of embedded system on top of an FPGA today. Uh, well researched, we can point you at the patents and we can point you at the research documents that, that were published at the time, as well as some of the stuff that we've done. And as I mentioned, JCore is a clean re-implementation in a dialect of VHDL. Uh, uh, the ESA and, and uh, Jiri Kaisler invented something called the two-process method, which is a very uh, um, safe way of designing hardware that may appeal more to software engineers than uh, the, the typical uh, approach that's usually done with IP cores. And JCore makes extensive use of generators, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, so that you can get started very quickly adding things to the instruction set if you want to or to the SOC buses. Designed from the ground up to do uh, signal processing, networking, and of course to run Linux. Um, the JCore family is uh, becoming quite extensive now. Uh, the ones that are out uh, for public consumption uh, are the J1. It's a simple a uh, 32-bit machine comes to about 30k ASIC gates. It's a five-stage pipeline. It it still has some DSP instructions. Um, uh, J2, of course, is the one that uh, is the full-up uh, Linux-capable, SMP-capable 50k ASIC gates device. It fits in mostly Xilinx FPGAs, uh, as we'll see a bit later. Rob? Um, what do yeah. you want to say about this? So, so uh, moving up and down from J2, uh, uh, there's also a J0 coming, which is a 16-bit data path, double clocked. It'll be about 15K ASIC gates. Uh, it'll fit in pretty much a, a, a very, very small FPGA, something like a, a, a 5K gate. Uh, ICE 40 will still have half of its space available. Um, to use yeah, for other J1, one. J1 does fit in an ICE 40, but it currently uses most of it. Um, J2 will fit in an LX9, and you'll have like 40% of it left. That's a Xilinx chip. Um, and J32, of course, adds virtual memory, uh, and and a multi-issue version of that is uh, is in the works. I'd like to point out that uh, J2 is the one we released first, and we then went down market to J1. We have J32 code complete, but haven't finished uh, porting Linux to it yet. We've 
prototyped a J64 to prove to ourselves that yes, this can scale up as as high as we need it to. But we found that the the current market opportunities are actually at the lower end because the volume of no MMU chips becomes absolutely insane. No MMU chips are to MMU chips a bit like bacterial cells are to mammal cells. There's a whole lot more of them in the ecosystem. They're just invisible. So in keeping with the topic today of uh, FPGAs and open source FPGAs, this board in the background uh, is one of those energy monitors that, that uh, we had mentioned previously. And the main chips on that are all FPGAs. Um, there is an ASIC, it's a mixed signal ASIC that we did for, for that project, but the entire brains of the device is inside an FPGA. Uh, at the time that we did that, uh, 2015, 16, it wasn't possible to uh, do it with a completely open source tool chain, uh, but later on, uh, another presenter uh, uh, today will, will talk about the, uh, uh, the how how that's changing. Um, J1 at the time at uh, right now is capable of being synthesized for uh, small FPGAs using completely open tools. The point of this is if you need to build some system with an FPGA that is more than just a system on chip, uh, JCore is a good choice for that. It was designed for that in the first place. The uh, uh, the IP cores that fit around the CPU do all kinds of very cool things, uh, especially the ones that were used for uh, things like uh, energy monitors. Yeah, we've done a lot of hard real-time data acquisition where you're not allowed to drop any of the samples and you must respond to them in microseconds or in some cases nanoseconds. The and... perfect, perfect use case for FPGAs is to, is to do that kind of thing. Um, now FPGAs are on cost par with microcontrollers, and that's a really interesting statement to be able to make. Uh, so you can take uh, J1 directly off of GitHub and put it in an ICE40 Ultra Plus device, which is uh, on the order of five US dollar um, uh, quantity one retail. And you end up with a 32-bit CPU that has a full open source tool chain, uh, a well-supported mature tool chain, and 128K of RAM. And that connects to uh, a, a flash on the outside, an SPI flash for 90 cents, and suddenly you have something that is significantly more powerful than an Arduino, uh, much more powerful than anything else that you could get for the same price. And at the same time, you have uh, 10%, 20% of the FPGA fabric still available to do any kind of device you want to see on the on the outside of the of the basic SOC platform. And okay. you have yeah, you ahead. have 128 megabytes or more of SPI flash memory. We have actually run a little system with an ICE40 and an SPI flash and three watch batteries. And the yeah. only reason there was three is that we needed three volts. We can probably get it down to one later. But the chips are literally smaller than the watch battery. We were thinking of doing a thing where we taped the chips to the front of the watch battery with clear plastic tape and had a little LED that it would blink just so you could see and maybe an infrared sensor and just go, this is the tiniest little system running our stuff as a demo. And, and it's a really exciting time to be getting into this because uh, all of that can be done with completely open tools now. Um, uh, a $15 FPGA can host a dual core J2 uh, plus a GPS baseband, and we'll see that later. Um, that, that kind of thing is interesting for stuff like drones. Unfortunately, the open tools are not quite there yet for, for all of that. You still need uh, some vendor tools for the FPGAs, but that will probably Alex change. Right. Yeah. Um, some applications need an FPGA anyway, and when that's the case, the entire SOC comes for free. Uh, the good thing about JCore, and to some extent RISC-V is in the same camp, um, the same RTL that you use for uh, FPGAs is ASIC ready. You can take a J2 CPU, 
it's uh, 0.45 millimeter squared in 180 nanometer process and it'll run 125 megahertz without breaking a sweat. It's very easy to see a path from a very small prototype that costs you a few tens of dollars uh, in FPGA to seed the market and then an ASIC that ends up being pennies per die. Yeah, Google is doing that Skylake stuff. Uh, about how fast would it run at 130 nanometer? Uh, 130 nanometer is probably going to be 175 megahertz, maybe 200 if you really push it, but uh, 175. Okay. Cool. Um, of course, the CPU is no use by itself. Uh, this is a platform approach. All of the things that we have we have done uh, are not about proving. Uh, uh, a CPU, it's about building a system. Uh, J-Core SOCs can be automatically generated. Uh, there's a project in the, in our GitHub that will let you add things to an SOC very easily to add things to the system on chip. There's a full st set of standard peripherals from memory controllers to cache controllers to Ethernet and LCD drivers. And of course, it's supported by OS and toolchain. Um, this is completely open. And our driving philosophy is to democratize the space. Uh, there's no need anymore for a large company to be involved when you're talking about your compute platform. You can do it for yourself. Um, there's multiple choices. JCore is one of them. Uh, and FPGAs make it possible, as Rob mentioned. Uh, we're now at the point where commodity FPGAs uh, meet the same uh, end specification as something that you would have to tape out a modern process for uh, in the mid 90s. Uh, hardware platforms to run it are all available on open licenses. You can see a little bit more of that. And there's, of course, mature tool chains and operating systems for all of this stuff. Um, yeah, an, an interesting thing to me is that um, Lattice, which has the fully open source tool chain, is now making larger FPGAs, although they're much slower than the Xilinx stuff in terms of how fast you can clock them. But even a 33 megahertz processor, that's how fast Linus Torvalds' machine was when he first wrote Linux. If depending on what your application is, if you wanted to do Linux in a fully open source toolchain thing, we don't necessarily need the other vendors are still being proprietary with their toolchain problem solved because multiple fronts are advancing in parallel and opening up. It's an exciting time. The, the entire ecosystem is, is here as well, and you get all the way from a hardware board uh, with open reference designs and boards you can clone and modify all the way through to uh, user space applications and utilities. So um, I think we'll we'll stop and see if there's any questions um, for our uh, sort of Japanese derived uh, core and then we'll move on to what you can do with it. Um, Is there yeah. yeah, we have uh, some questions and comments. Uh, let me just fish them out. Yeah. Um, so someone asked, uh, what's the actual uh, website uh, URL? Is that still j-core.org? Uh, j-core.org is good, and uh, there's a link on there to the GitHub, but we'll also put that up at the end. Okay. Yeah, I, and, I, need, uh, to, I need to update the content on j-core.org. Um, what's there is accurate, but not entirely up to date. There's some newer stuff on our GitHub and on the mailing list. Um, and just uh, feedback that. Um, Somebody, uh, Jeremy, uh, had his uh, PhD on exactly the to uh, topic of like code density and optimization. Um, so he was very found it very interesting so far. Um, we've had reports of like people having issues with not being able to see the slides. Um, if you're on the web view, um, it seems to be that um, Firefox is working better than Chrome, um, and generally refreshing your browser uh, has resolved the issue. Um, and that's all for now. So if you want to move on, let's go. So, uh, what can you do with with this? So, uh, uh, we freely admit that, and and it's sort of a plus on one side uh, that the JCore ecosystem has been somewhat closed uh, uh, from the beginning uh, because uh, it was designed for specific applications in mind. 
And this is a board that we did for a big S company in Germany. Uh, it uses a J-Core SOC um, in an FPGA. Um, this is a three-phase energy monitor. It's not a simple thing like a uh, uh, like a watt meter. This this does capture of waveforms uh, in the megahertz region. Uh, it does uh, all kinds of digital signal processing. Uh, it has secure time and location with a GPS receiver, and this is just one of the boards in that system. But it's it's sort of an example to get you thinking about the complexity of systems that you might build. And so the landscape for devices uh, goes from Arduino class things with a J1 core in, say, an ICE 40 to small devices like a Raspberry Pi class device. We'll show you a board for that later with a dual core J2 running Linux uh, to large uh, compute intensive or signal processing things, which for me personally is very interesting uh, and the reason that we did this. And of course, uh, none of these things is possible without uh, good tools, uh, without the FPGA marketplace being uh, ready to build these kinds of devices. So finally, we're getting to the point where these things are practical for the average person to jump into and start working on, on, their, on their kitchen table if they want to do that. And it's very easy to prototype a design with uh, any of the boards that are available. Uh, and if your commercial side uh, works out, you can scale to ASIC. Um, anything 180 nanometer or newer is very practical for this uh, for this type of uh, of migration path from uh, from open source FPGA all the way to uh, commodity class uh, an popcorn. Interesting, an interesting discussion we've had is that there's also a sweet spot in ASIC manufacturing for power consumption because as you go down from 180 nanometers, the chips get more expensive and they get faster, but they also get more power efficient to a point. And then the newer things like that, that five nanometer stuff they're working on aren't necessarily as power efficient. If you want something where this is going to run off of a watch battery for six months, you don't necessarily want an old ASIC and you don't necessarily want a new ASIC. And then we're specking, well, how long will for example, an ICE-40 FPGA run off of this battery versus how long will the ASIC run off of it, the, the trade-off isn't necessarily performance, it's power consumption and battery life. So there's, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of stuff to come up to speed on here, and it's really interesting. Yeah, and that brings us to the application spaces as well. Um, uh, with just using an FPGA, you can do sort of four classes of device um, uh, with this type of uh, a design flow. You can make small systems. I've, I've prattled on about that for, for quite a long time. Uh, low power, is, as Rob mentions, is a big thing. It turns out that those uh, open tools, FPGAs from Lattice, the, the ICE-40 series, can get down to something like 100 microamps of standby current. And what that means is six months of battery life from a, from a $5 FPGA. Uh, three milliamps of burst uh, current, uh, power supply current when it's running. Uh, so you set the thing up to do maybe Bluetooth low energy or you set it up to sample some value or temperature or something every once in a while. And then the, the CPU core goes back to sleep and the FPGA reverts to drawing its, uh, its leakage current of about 77 microamps and there's a few microamps left over for the STI flash. Um, little machines can be built with uh, reasonable size FPGAs for sub $60. Uh, it's, it's interesting to note that uh, when you design uh, uh, like a, a gateway or a router or any kind of connected IoT device, there's sort of a base cost for the compute engine that is required to run Linux and connect to the network. And that's traditionally been about a $35 device, not talking about the tiny, tiny Bluetooth connected things and talking about sort of an Ethernet connected device with a with a 100 megahertz or above class uh, dual core CPU and FPGAs and memory, are not, enough and, memory and enough memory and FPGAs are not quite cost parity with that yet, but it's coming really close. Uh, you can get. Uh, about sub $60 for low quantity. 
uh, including all peripherals. And how much does the LPDDR2 chip that we're using uh, for the 128 megs for Linux ballpark cost? It's about three three dollars and fifty cents in thousand piece quantities. So okay. it, it's it's sort of a reasonable price adder for a system to get the capability to run to run Linux. And 128 then, megs is about the low end for running a current Linux kernel comfortably. Right. And then there's compute intensive and signal processing applications uh, where you might have dedicated coprocessors or you might have application specific accelerators and those things fit in uh, larger FPGAs. And uh, uh, speaking with the guys at Google who uh, are looking at all the different tool flows, uh, there is very soon, and I'm sure we'll hear about it in the OSIS in the next PNR talk later, um, uh, coming very soon will be ultra scale support. And with that kind of FPGA, uh, if your application can afford the cost of an ultra scale FPGA, you can run uh, multiple uh, Linux capable J core systems in one FPGA and still have uh, enough gates to do uh, massive parallel FFTs or whatever kind of digital signal processing you want. Just a quick tangent. Um, J2 is an SMP system and the SH2 chip that we cloned is, well, re-implemented. It's none of our actual circuitry is remotely the same, but the SH2 wasn't SMP because SMP really started taking over the world between 2000 and 2005, several years later, we actually had to add um, comp exchange. We had to analyze what Linux needed and the comp, comp exchange instruction wasn't just for SMP, but few Texas assume that it is available, which the older architecture didn't have, and you had to awkwardly work around with test and set loops, and it was very inefficient. This isn't just, oh, there was a perfect old technology. This is, we had to reevaluate what do we act need in the modern world. This was a very good base, but we spent five years dog fooding it and basically going, okay, we're putting it in these things. We're running current systems on it. What are the issues we're seeing? What are the bottlenecks that are happening? What are the things that we could improve based on actual real world use on a daily basis? And that's a very important part of the development process. You don't just you don't use the waterfall method where you say, here is the design we're going to start with and we resolve not to learn anything at any point in the process until we're done. There is a constant feedback loop. That's always been one of the strengths of open source development and one of the reasons we wanted to get it out there for other people to bang on as well. But we've been doing that internally from day one as how we made this, this SOC. And, and the reason we were able to do that for, for that period of time is because FPGAs allow you to do circuitry with rapid iterations. So the, the entire point of the field programmable nature of the FPGA, the field programmable gate array, gives you that ability to iterate your designs and try things out instead of having to uh, do all the design up front and kind of cross your fingers and get, get yourself uh, uh, painted into a corner. And not um, just that, you can implement something and then decide after you've gotten it working that it's not the way you wanted to go. We switched from a prefetch engine to a proper L1 cache. We switched from the original Super H, um, what was it, LLP? It, they had their own coordination mechanism and we went to a more conventional comp exchange after we had the previous one working because we had the luxury of being able to go, okay, we tried it and now we know and we want to do something else. So today you can get boards and platforms um, uh, from various different places that, that will run uh, J-Core. Uh, these are some of, uh, some of ours. Um, 
on the on the left hand side. The one up on the right corner uh, is uh, is from a is from a colleague of Rob's in in Austin, Texas. Uh, the one in the center here is uh, we call it the Turtle Board or the JX platform, and that is a fairly large um, uh, Xilinx FPGA. There's about 30% of it used for a uh, system on chip base that includes two CPU cores, uh, memory controllers for uh, uh, low power DDR, um, also includes things like Ethernet. Uh, so basically you get a Raspberry Pi equivalent board with half an FPGA, uh, half a very large FPGA available for you to do whatever you might do in it. And I'll show you a board uh, in a couple slides that fits on top of this uh, as to why that's a cool thing. And the one yeah, up on the left... specifically Pi 2 slash 3, but not 4. 4 uses a different case, but ours will fit in a, in a Raspberry Pi 3 case. So the one up on the left hand at the top is a Kintex 7, uh, very large FPGA. That's, um, uh, it's, uh, uh, what is it? It's, it's under a, the heat sink. It's a 160. It's under the, under the, under the heat sink. Um, the the full up uh, system on chip base is about five percent of that FPGA, uh, and those boards are available uh, to do all kinds of really cool signal processing kinds of things. We filled up the rest of the space with a lot of very large, very fast DSPs and a DMA engine that handled sixty four channels. Tools and components, uh, of course, is important. Um, uh, uh, we use GHDL internally for all of our development. It's it's kind of interesting. Uh, one thing about open source, I'm sure everyone here on the on on this on this call knows, uh, proprietary tool chains, proprietary uh, compilers uh, always have bugs that the vendor uh, uh, doesn't fix. Maybe grandfathers across. GHDL is pretty close to. Uh, language reference manual compliant, uh, the standard for for VHDL. It and is. They actually a, take bug reports when they're not. And they take bug reports when they're not. And EOSIS, uh, uh, they have uh, uh, testing suite uh, to make sure that they are for Verilog as well. So these are the gold standard uh, for not only open source but including all commercial implementations. Uh, that's our opinion, and we're sticking to it. Um, those are those are the gold standard. Uh, J1 and J2 have test benches. You can uh, download them and without any hardware, simulate and extend on your desktop in simulation. And then of course, uh, all the rest of the tools that uh, uh, that programmers are used to, a complete set of uh, GNU C libraries and uh, and compilers are available. All the scripts to build all of the tools. Uh, we're thinking and we might need a Docker image. Uh, to put all of these things together into something. Internally, we use virtual machine image, and it's a little bit unwieldy. The, the main issue, of course, is that there are many components, uh, many tool chain components that you need to get together, and at the moment, it's a bit of a, a, a hurdle to get over uh, compiling and installing all of the tools. Rich Felker and I build everything from source because we're the crazy people who do that. We do not expect anyone else to do that. They need something right. that just works. So our GitHub repositories are organized into a hierarchy. You can uh, grab uh, um, not only the manual for the board, but also the design files for, for one of our boards. Uh, the CPU core is there. Um, the system on chip base that will assemble together for you. Uh, a complete uh, microcontroller, and uh, some really interesting uh, peripheral cores. Um, have a look at the jcore-jx turtle platform board. All the files are there. And uh, of course, uh, if you're on a small device like, a, like an ICE40, um, uh, then jcore j1 ghdl is a tiny little design that you can use for that. Uh, uh, and jx it, is the official name for the Raspberry Pi form factor board. Turtle was the development name. We're supposed to stop using it, but you know, yeah. it's kind of burned into our brains. It is what it is. Um, so uh, in the background here, this is um, a pipeline for our GPS receiver baseband that we made available a few weeks ago. Uh, this particular 
uh, IP core uses a J2 SMP system with Linux, and uh, the signal processing is split between hardware and software. It's a really good um, example of the kinds of things you can do with an FPGA plus an open CPU core plus something else, whatever that else happens to be in this case. The use of task set. Yeah. We're, uh, we're trying to get hard real time out of Linux and it doesn't want to give it to us, but we had a large rock. Yeah, so I mean, you can use the FPGA to solve some of the hard real time problems, uh, but generally speaking, this is an application where um, uh, you couldn't use a Raspberry Pi. Even if the CPU cores were faster, you would still need an FPGA to do this. Uh, you can add, take this, um, this GPS receiver uh, reference design for instance, and add something like motor controllers and make your own autonomous vehicle. That's a really interesting kind of thing. And scaling, as we talked about, both upwards and downwards, and I, I won't belabor that. So getting started, uh, when Hitachi did this, only a big company could. Uh, small boards are available, installation of the tools. Um, there's another talk today about that. Uh, template RTL is there. Uh, it can be modified to do some cool things. Um, and after that, it's as simple as developing software. You can modify the CPU core just as if it was a piece of your software. Turtle platform, as I mentioned, um, everything in a soft core, uh, J2 SMP, 63 megahertz, it's a little bit slow, but uh, again, that's because FPGAs are now just catching up with uh, with uh, with the process technology of of the 1990s. Uh, there's a lot of overhead in in the FPGA, so that's to be expected. But it's still a practical device. Uh, standard Raspberry Pi type peripherals are available, and uh, it, there's some work in progress to do, which uh, uh, we certainly hope people uh, contribute to. This one's a mature design. We did it in 2017, uh, and even the board layout is available for you to reuse and change. Um, that ahead. big expensive FPGA with the heatsink on it, we had it running, uh, I think, a little over 100 megahertz on that. But the the difference is a Spartan 6 is a $20 chip, and that FPGA was mid three digits, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so here's a, uh, an example at the other end that's not a dev board. This is, well, it's sort of a dev board. This is uh, what, what I call Open42S. Um, if there are engineers in the crowd, um, the 42, HP42S is sort of the pinnacle of calculators. Um, uh, if you're from the HP side of the fence and not the TI side. Uh, this is an example of a two-chip solution to recreating that calculator with, uh, with uh, uh, with the excellent Free42 uh, re-implementation uh, in software running on a J-Core. Uh, it's two chips. There's a Lattice FPGA and an SPI flash. It's sort of hand-waving because it's also power supply, but, but that's fine. It pulls 77 microamps in standby current. Every keystroke, there's one, micro, one milliamp for, you know, about 100 milliseconds. You get six months of battery life. This is a practical example you could use to build... Uh, user interface for maybe a CNC controller or something like that. Um, this one is actually really interesting. Uh, this is our GPS hat. Inside the can there you see in the background is uh, just um, uh, RF receiver to digital IF. It produces uh, samples at 16.368 uh, mega samples per second. There's no processor on this board. It's not a uh, a, uh, a GPS module or a GPS system in package chip. It's just the RF. And that goes to the Turtle Boards FPGA where there's the uh, peripheral core for the GPS correlators and the J2 does uh, all the solution. Uh, this, this shows you how to do that kind of thing. And you can add this to your own board and suddenly have time and location. I'd like to say a couple of things about both of these boards. The calculator board from the previous page, when I was saying there's the two-chip solution that you can scotch tape to a watch battery, 
that's basically the brain of the calculator. The, the rest of the calculator is providing IO devices and a form factor where you won't accidentally drop it and not be able to find it again. For the GPS, you are receiving real-time signals where what you're trying to measure is speed of light propagation delays where time differences are literally measured in nanosecond, not nanoseconds, some of them in fractions of a nanosecond. So the hardware has to receive this, process it, and deliver it to the Linux system as packets of historical data with timestamps that say, at this time, we saw this, because just getting it from one side of the board to the other side of the board and loading it into the processor is already enough signal delay that it's gone past, something else has already happened. So everything you're doing is processing, okay, here's a historical snapshot of what I saw, what did that mean? And then you have tracking loops that need to be updated in microseconds where you have to respond to say, okay, I understood the data that I saw, adjust the filters of what you're looking for so that the new packets that are coming in are processed in this way so that I'm filtering for this signal for the specific satellites I'm tracking. So there's very hard real time that the hardware is having to deal with. And then there's still very real time, but measured an order of magnitude more leniently, which is still a human will never even notice that it happened because microseconds are, are still insane. You know, so there's, is, there's multiple layers of real time going on here. It took us, oh, two and a half years to get this sucker to actually work, but we finally did and we're very proud of it. And we've released a uh, We've released large chunks of it on GitHub. So that's that's the kind of thing that an FPGA makes possible. Uh, and uh, it's really, really sort of an exciting uh, time to be working on this kind of thing where all of the open tool chains are coming available uh, so well, that everybody can get their hands dirty. Uh, not just an FPGA, we also needed Linux because we're doing a lot of signal processing on the resulting packets and the availability of a full Linux system where we, we can go, okay, this part needs to, to go out and do some floating point stuff and the Leibniz determinants and all those kind of things. Chunks of, chunks of processing, you know, we have a GUI that is display, it's a text mode GUI, but it's displaying, here's the tracking data we're seeing. We have, you know, Linux being normal, providing a certain amount of user inter interface and just general plumbing, you know, scripts and stuff. And then we have, here is a real time chunk where we've task set something to a processor that is running at SCED RR priority. And then here is the correlator within the FPGA, and then here is the carefully tuned signal path that Martin did so you don't get feedback with data being handed off from the GPS hat into the GPIO pins and stuff. We've got like four layers of time of, of time constraints, even down to the GUI can't be that sluggish or you're not, you know, you're not happy as a user, that the FPGA provides the flexibility to scale all the way to we're doing funky signal processing things on the input to we're running Linux and we want to tune Linux slightly using normal system administration methods. So I think so there's uh, sort of as a takeaway uh, uh, from that, uh, all of this it is available for other people to build on. Yeah, I think that's, that's sort of a message that uh, that that I want to make sure everybody understands. So if you want to do this kind of work, uh, we're making that stuff available to the open source community so that uh, you can then take the basic implementation and do something really cool with it. So there we are. Uh, any any questions or or uh, yes yes. 
Yeah, th there's quite a few questions, but we've got like uh, basically like uh, five or so minutes. So I'll pick some out um, yeah. and maybe you can um, answer. I, I, we can do this over email afterwards. Uh, that might be easier. Um, so sure. we Drew also have Fistini. a mailing list. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, so Drew Festini asks, uh, for Linux on uh, no MMU, uh, is there a way to support shared libraries and user space? Um, I believe ARM has FDPIC yes. ABI for that. Uh, we had FDPIC first. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, we've had FDPIC working for a few years. FDPIC is basically ELF with extra data, so that the the four main segments have been have been broken up so that they can independently load into different chunks of memory. The text segment, the data segment, um, RO data, and BSS don't have to be contiguous. But other than that, it's normal elf it's normal elf with a bit set in the header saying i'm slightly different and then some extra annotation in the tables and then the compiler builds things with instead of one base pointer it has four base pointers but other than that i mean there's there's a little bit of difference but it mostly acts like elf and in fact the on systems with mmu the security people are interested in ftpic because it's kind of asler on steroids you can you can relocate everything independently, so there's even more relocation to screw up people's no no op slides. So yes, so, yes, yes, yes yeah. you can. Yeah, we mostly don't bother because we're old embedded people, and it's like here's a statically linked binary, and I don't have to care about dependencies. But you don't have to. MuscleLibc yeah. supports it just fine. The 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 base system that you come with has libc as a shared library right now. Muscle libc specifically is the one we're using, but okay. the maintainer is on our team. So, and I believe uh, they're also the maintainer for Super H in Linux as well. That's correct. Yes. Well, we cool. we kind of asked him to do that, with you know, we we signed a check and asked him to do it because you know he's on our team. Great stuff. Um, okay, another question um, on Risk Five. Kendrite K210, uh, we can really uh, only run on one BusyBox instance before running out of uh, eight megabyte SRAM memory. I'm curious how JCore handles it. Uh, it just doesn't need to be that large. Uh, so uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly uh, what the issue is, but eight megabytes is probably uh, enough. Uh, our boards are quite a bit larger than that because we're DDR memory instead of probably SDRAM. Uh, but uh, the other problem is uh, RISC-V is sort of an inefficient uh, instruction set architecture from a uh, from an instruction set density point of view, which is kind of the reason we decided not to go with those traditional approaches, either Spark or MIPS. Um, but but I don't think that that's the reason why. I think I think there's just things that can be done to improve the situation. Um, another possibility is if they're doing a no MMU system and they didn't have FDPIC available, they may have done a PI, position independent code, which does allow the, the binary to be completely relocated, but it doesn't break up the segments into four independent chunks. And what that means is every instance of like bash, if you load, th if you run three instances of bash, they won't share the read-only parts. They won't share the text section. They won't share the RO data because they have to be contiguous in memory. So their writable sections, in order for those to be unique, they need their own copies of the read-only sections. FDPIC on no MMU was invented to make much more efficient use of the memory because if you're running five copies of Bash, you only have one copy of the text of of the executable code, the text section, ELF text section loaded, and only one copy of the RO data loaded. So you only need to allocate your stack and your heap and your data section and your BSS. BSS is the memory that is that starts zeroed, so doesn't need to be stored in the file, but is otherwise global data. Cool. Um, Jeremy comments, uh, RISC-V is not good at code density. Uh, embed results confirm this. ARC is much better uh, data comparison. Um, interestingly, ARC and SuperH had the same uh, compiler engineer, Jorn Reneke. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, uh, it also has to do with the, um, with, uh, 
with the density of the instruction packing. So RISC V is a 32-bit instruction for uh, uh, for each and every instruction. It does have a 16-bit extension, but uh, most people don't seem to implement it. The other thing that SH has, uh, and some uh, purists will call it uh, sort of CISC-like um, instead of RISC uh, uh, attributes to it. Uh, when you start doing things like uh, like um, uh, analysis of instruction frequency, uh, you start to realize that some things might need to be fused together in order to get good performance, or you might need a more complex instruction than a RISC machine would do. So there, are, those are the two places where Super H does things uh, differently than RISC V. The instructions are very densely packed. Uh, Super H. Super H valued instruction density during its design, and when we say it's a sweet spot in the history of of chip design, one of the things we're talking about is CISC happened. It wasn't really designed. It just sort of occurred over many years. RISC was specifically designed as here's a new idea where all of our instructions are fixed length, and you know, that not only lets us simplify the circuitry, but it also allows a second processor core, sorry, execution engine, to look over the shoulder of the first one and execute the next instruction if it doesn't interfere with this one, because we know where the next one starts without having had to decode it. It's like, that's really cool. But each one of those takes one clock cycle as part of the definition. And if you have something that inherently needs two, three, four clock cycles, you break it up into multiple instructions, which is part of what bloats your your code and eats L1 cache lines unnecessarily. And what the Super H guys did is they went, well, we can take a risk instruction set where every instruction is 16 bits. It's a two bytes per instruction, fine, but we're going to microcode it anyway so that if this instruction does need to take four clock cycles because it's going out to memory and there's a wait state coming back and then it needs a post increment that also needs a clock cycle because it's it's operating on the result of, of a calculation or whatever. If you need two clock cycles, if you need three clock cycles, if you need four clock cycles, you can do it in one instruction. That's part of how they got the better density. It is a microcoded risk, which seems a little bit like a contradiction in terms, but at the same time is the best of both worlds. It has the sure. advantages of both approaches. And it's very simple, light microcoding that doesn't take a lot of circuitry to implement because when the Super H guys were making their chip, the transistor budgets they had were tiny and they had to be clever to fit lots and lots of stuff in there. Whereas so a few years later, time, I'm kind of conscious of the time, Rob. Oh, so, uh, yeah, I just want to want to make sure we get as many many yeah. questions as possible. Uh, very specifically, yeah, I can enthuse for a while. Yeah, very specific. <laughs> that's a good thing. Inci excitement's important. Very specifically, I just wanted to mention that the instruction encoding here is a front end, so it's a risk pipeline that we have in Super H and in J Core but uh, there may be more than one issue into that pipeline for each very short 16-bit instruction. And we can move on from there. 